This is my brother, Dan. We almost look alike, right? Little differences. That's because we have a different father and a different mother. And this is how we'd introduce ourselves to everyone. But we're brothers, and if you look on Facebook, we're brothers there, and that's what counts. Our story actually begins at the end, the end of the world. We met on a trip down to the tip of Baja, California, when the world was coming to an end. It was the end of the Mayan calendar, end of 2012. And we met, and from the moment we met each other, we absolutely hated each other. I was like, who is this tall guy cracking the jokes that I would make, stealing all my good lines? Who is he? And it was just war between the two of us. He'd walk around, he's like, that Dr. North isn't as smart as he thinks he is. You know, actually, I'm the smartest guy in the room. Just so I could hear. There was even one point, we were walking down the street, and mind you, I was doing a lot of yoga at the time, and I had my arm around him, and somehow I managed to kick him right in the face as we were walking down the street. He's like, how did you do that? So Dan and I started pulling out all the stops. And I have to give you a little background on Dan before uh, you'll really understand the significance of this. For Dan's last semester of college, he went off to Sweden to do a semester abroad. And while he was there, he got a job bartending in this kind of uh, right? So this nation where all the people in the country come from different counties together. And he was in his bar one day, and he, he saw this guy with a beer bottle with a straw in it. And he's like, I know what this is. And so he's like, yeah, you, you take it and you put the straw in the beer bottle and then you can drink the beer faster because the air flows out. Dan's like, oh, that's like a beer bong. And the Swede was like, what's a beer bong? For those of you that don't know what a beer bong is, it's basically you take a funnel and you attach a hose to it and a clamp and then you just pour beer down it. It's a great American innovation. So Dan goes down to the, the local hardware shop and he gets the funnel and he gets the hose and he gets the clamp and he goes up to the register and he puts them all down on the counter. And this ancient Sweden, this little town in Sweden, looks down at it, looks up at it and he's like, you're making contraption to drink alcohol quickly. <laughs> Dan's like, how the heck do you know that? And the Swede's like, ah, 10 years ago, an American just like you came in here and he bought the same things. And he, I asked him what it was for, and he told me. Dan's like, okay, that's a little weird. Anyway, he goes back to his bar. He brings it, and everyone is amazed, because Swedes love to drink a lot. So if you can make it faster, the better. So he's doing it, and they start, they call him OBB, becomes his nickname, Original Beer Bong. And it becomes his identity in Sweden, right? So here we are. We're in 2013, basically. He was, uh, 2003, he was there in Sweden. And here the two of us are having this just absolute verbal brawl. And he's like, oh yeah? Well, I introduced the beer bong to Sweden. And I'm like, oh, I got this guy right now. Because what Dan did not know is that I had been an exchange student in 1993 <laughs> in that same town in Sweden. And I look at him, I'm like, no. I introduced the beer bong in Lund, Sweden in 1993. And all Dan could hear was, 10 years ago. <laughs> so seeing as there was only one person on the entire planet that could call him out, and it was me, we figured, you know what? We're going to have to be friends. But we also looked at each other, we're like, you know, we're not the types of guys that are just going to sit around and watch sports together, right? This is not our identity. You know, we love projects, we love adventures, we love doing a lot of good for the world. And so we sat down and decided, you know what? If we're gonna spend time together, we better have a project. And we better go on an adventure. And so I go, oh, what are you like? Well, we both met, our story starts in Sweden, so why not Sweden? I'm like, great. I always wanted to go to the Baltics. Great, let's, let's go to Sweden, then go to the Baltics. He's like, uh, let's make it more fun. I'm like, okay, sweet. Um, why don't we dress up like Vikings? Like, sure. <laughs> I'm like, but I also want it to be significant and you know, something you really care about. He's like, what do you care about? I'm like, climate change. It's like, great. We'll go on a trip, we start in Sweden, go through the Baltics, we'll dress up like Vikings, and we'll save the planet and climate change. And so first thing we did is went to Sweden and we built a Viking ship. <laughs> this is in Stockholm. And then of course, you can be Vikings, you gotta dress up. And so here we are, landing in Estonia, dressed up like Vikings in our Viking ship. 
And more than that, though, we would meet people, and they're like, well, what are you guys doing? We're like, oh, well, actually, you know, in 1550, Estonia was facing the greatest threat of their time, Ivan the Terrible coming over, and it was the Swedes that came down, joined forces, and was able to fend off Ivan the Terrible. And we were like, yeah, this is history, this is true. We're like, well, we're here to fend off the greatest threat of your time, climate change. We're back. Which makes no sense, because it wasn't Vikings that came down, and we're actually Americans, but that didn't matter to us. We created this reality. We created the story that we believed, and everyone around us believed us, and it helped that we had a Viking ship to sell it. But it was more than just going and dress up like Vikings and going out to nightclubs and being quite popular. Um, we also met with significant thought leaders, people that were working on sustainability. We in uh, Lithuania, we met Vladis Lassis, the co-founder of the Carbon War Room. He actually took us for a hot air balloon ride, dressed up like Vikings. It's kind of a surreal trip. Um, and I actually, I landed an interview with the former president of the Czech Republic, who doesn't really believe in climate change. Um, and everyone told me, he's a very smart man, you know, you'll never get this guy. You'll never give him a question he can't answer. I got him. <laughs> I got him. My final question to him was, if you could have a climate debate with one of two people, would you rather have it with Al Gore or Paris Hilton? He couldn't answer that. <laughs> so this was Save the Ice. And it was so much of an adventure and a story to us. You know, and it really fell in line with, with who we are, with who Dan was. Dan would go on adventures. It would take him to the bottom of the sea. Uh, it would take him uh, spear fishing. We went on another trip to the Maldives. He would go to the top of the mountains. And Dan was actually um, all this time working for Google, strangely enough. He actually founded the Google Adventure Team. Uh, as, as well as he was the head of privacy for Google X. So on one hand, he was this very successful executive engineer. On the other hand, these crazy adventures. On the other hand, he's doing ridiculous things like save the ice with me. Our slogan was neat, because when you don't put ice in a cocktail, it's called neat. So save the ice, it's, it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> And that was him on Everest, actually, with the NEAT. And so uh, in, in 2015, he was climbing Everest for Save the Ice, for Google, but most of all for, for Dan. Um, and when I asked him, he said, you know, when you're up on the mountain, it, it's you alone. And you can't be there for anyone else or any organization, because it's hard. And you've got to be there just for yourself. So in 2015, April 25th, is when the earthquake struck Nepal. And an avalanche swept through base camp and it took Dan's life. And it was a big story, because uh, Dan was an executive at Google, and you probably read about it. It was all over the international press um, about the Google executive that was, that was killed in Everest. And, and it, was, it was really hard, you know, A, losing your, your best friend and brother, but also seeing in the media this just the story of him just being a Google executive. It was really sad. You know, because there was so much more to Dan. You know, not only was he a great friend, um, and um, but <clears throat> but he was also a thought leader. You know, he would actually go speak for Google and lead initiatives for them. A rising star there, and he was a fearless adventurer. So constantly adventuring, climbing the, the tallest mountains, and just being with Dan was a constant adventure. Um, he supported an orphanage in Nepal, and he's dead. And then, of course, we would go on other Save the Ice trips. Um, we went to the Maldives, and he saw, I know, it looks really rough. <laughs> <laughs> There's no ice there to save, but we wanted to see what was happening with the ice melting, with, you know, taking over islands. <laughs> we were really good at this, making sure that we were having a great time. Uh, in, the, in the worlds and the realities that we created. And of course, Dan you know, is encapsulated in a lot of the Burning Man culture. Um, and so we actually created a whole campaign to go against kind of the international media um, called Live Dan. And this was more about capturing who Dan was, about him as someone that had these passions and these drives and just was absolutely fearless to go out into the world and to live it, to live Dan. And it was inspiring. People from all around the world, I get mail still, thousands of people were inspired by his story about him doing what he was most passionate about. A lot of people quit their jobs. 
and a lot of people probably don't make a lot of money now, but <laughs> they're out there and they're living these absolutely glorious lives. Uh, and people go and they do it in their own ways. Um, Flo goes and climbs mountains, and every mountaintop he, he hoists the Live Dan flag. You know? And for me, I was always about, you know, about me living my passions. And so I build high performance electric cars, I go build robots. I go do my TV show. I go do my other TV show. I go do another. <laughs> and for me, this was about going and living Dan, about taking my passions and going out and inspiring the world with it. Whether it's drones at Burning Man or giving a commencement talk at UC Santa Barbara or going on a camelback trip on the, the border of Pakistan and India. And of course, building Viking ships <laughs> of all sorts of varieties. And then backpacking. But something was still missing for me. And earlier this summer, I just didn't feel complete. Despite all these things I'm doing, I went on a, a long solo backpacking trip. And on the trip, I really reflected on, you know, what it is that, how I want to live fearlessly. What, what is my greatest fear in life? And I thought about it for a long time. And I realized my greatest fear in life is losing the love of my mother. There's nothing that I fear more than that. And my mom always had three roles for me. No motorcycle, no piercings, and no tattoos. <laughs> so it seems silly, but to overcome my fear of losing the love of my mother, I just went and got a tattoo. <laughs> it's a raptor claw, and Dan's nickname was Raptor, his playa name, as it were. And so you can see in the Live Dan logo, the actual raptor claw up in the head. And so I thought no better way than to get Dan's insignia on my foot so he could walk and run with me for the rest of my life. And I, I went and showed my mom this, and my mom just looked at me, he's like, what? Oh, Michael, I will love you no matter what. And I just realized in that moment how absolutely silly that was, that I would lose the love of my mother over having a tattoo on my foot. Yeah. And then I realized that that wasn't it at all. That wasn't my, my fear. That, that, that wasn't it. It was more that my mom represented society to me and it was what society wanted from me. It was what my mother wanted from me. You know, as the 4.0 student, I got the PhD, I did all of that, but it was always what society was putting on me. And with Dan, it wasn't about society. It was about us creating our own reality. It was, and trust me, we could create some pretty weird realities. <laughs> and so the two of us had this incredible power to create the reality, to shape the world around us, instead of allowing the world to shape us. And so this was my, my realization, was that what I need to do is I need to live fearlessly, and I need to not let the world shape me, but I need to be the one to shape the world around me. So I would like to invite all of you to shape the world around you and to live Dan. Thank you. <laughs>